And with the day of the feast of all saints, come back again in Nashville here. And the epistle for this feast of all saints, it uh, falls on a Sunday this year, the 22nd Sunday of Pentecost, but today the feast of all saints. The epistle is taken from the book of Apocalypse, chapter 7. In those days, behold, I, John, saw another angel ascending and rising, ascending from the rising of the sun, having the sign of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we sign the servants of our God upon their foreheads. But I heard the number of them that were signed. A hundred and forty-four thousand were signed, of every tribe of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Reuben, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Gad, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Aser, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Simeon, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Levi, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Issachar, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Zabulon, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Joseph, twelve thousand signed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, twelve thousand signed. After this, I saw a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and in the sight of the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne, and the ancients and the four living creatures. And they fell down before the throne upon their faces, and adored God, saying, Amen, benediction and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever. And the Gospel. Taking that according to St. Matthew, chapter 5. At that time, Jesus, seeing the multitudes, went up into the mountain, into a mountain. And when he was sat down, his disciples came unto him. And opening his mouth, he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall have their fill. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they that suffer persecution for justice' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you, and speak all that is evil against you untruly for my sake. Be glad and rejoice, for your reward is very great in heaven. Those are the words of today's Holy Gospel. Amen. Father, Son, and Ghost, Amen. To tell you this feast of all saints, and that is a feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary, first of all. It is a feast of Our Lady. This feast should be called the Feast of the Blessed Virgin and all the saints. That no one becomes a saint. No one comes to God without passing through her hands, with all, all graces passing through her hands, and without her being the one to make us grow from little infants to adults in the way of Christ. Christ grew from infancy to adulthood in the presence of Mary. And every saint must grow from infancy to adulthood in the presence of Mary. And if we don't grow from infancy to adulthood in the presence of Mary, then we cannot be another Christ. We cannot be saints. So that those who think there's any way to become a saint without the Blessed Virgin Mary are liars and fools. So this, this feast is a, one of the feasts that we consider the Blessed Virgin Mary because she is the one who forms saints. But it's also a feast of the history of our world. For St. John talks about it, he says, what is the history of this world? What's the next stage in the history of the world? Well, we have a temporary stage of a chastisement coming up, followed by a victory of the church, followed by the coming of the Antichrist after a collapse. But the final stage of the church is the one in which, then, and I, John, saw another angel ascending from the rise of the sun and having the sign of the living God. 
And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we sign the servants of our God upon their foreheads. And so there will be a final hurting. The hurting is in this kind of hurting that's referred to by the sacred scripture is the hurting of God to the damned, to all those that are going to be judged on the day of their death and also in the death of our world. And there is going to be a judgment of the earth and a judgment of the sea. And the angels are going to participate in the making of this judgment to happen. But let not this happen until we have signed all of those that are to be saved upon their foreheads. So what is the history of the world? Imagine that we are angels and the world is coming to an end and we see all the soldiers running back to the city and there is a war going on outside the city and the siege. When does this siege end? When the last just person passes through the gates. When the last just person passes through the gates and is sealed upon the forehead, then the gate is closed and all those outside the gate, they shall be damned. Imagine watching all those animals walking on the ark, two by two. And they were all going on the ark, all these thousands of kinds of animals. And we thought that it would never end, seeing all these beautiful creatures of God walking on the ark. And Moses, or rather Noah, was there, and he was counting all the animals. And he was making sure that they all went on the ark. And when they were all on the ark, and the last of the animals went on the ark, then Noah and his children walked on the ark. And then the door was closed. And then those who were outside the ark, they drowned. Those who were inside the ark, they were saved. And what is happening right now in Holy Mother, the church, the church triumphant is like unto that ark. And there are soldiers walking from the church militant into that church triumphant. And they're being watched. Noah is watching them closely as they pass in. There will be no one that walks onto that ark of the church triumphant the victorious church, who is not a saint. And there will be no one who is outside that church who shall be saved. And so there they are walking on that church, they're walking on that ark, and he's watching everyone. Finally there will be the last saint to enter, and then the door shall be closed, and then judgment shall come. So what is the history of the world? It is the history of the choices of men. Now there are two choices of men. There's a choice of man choosing God, and the choice of man choosing himself and choosing Satan and choosing sin, which is all the same thing. What is the history of the world? It is the history of men choosing God. And what happens is that God looks down upon the earth and he sees all these millions and billions of souls. Now there are seven billion souls upon the earth. And all seven billion are being called to be saints. All seven billion are being called inside the holy ark of the church. All are being called to seek God face to face and rejoice with Him in the kingdom of heaven. All are being called to that. But not all are coming. So many millions of cows, so many millions of lions, so many millions of sheep, but only two by two did they walk on the ark. And so we see that there are every type of soul. We are all not only different in, uh, uh, individually, but we are different types. And there every type of soul, there must be two by two to enter the church. There must be every kind of personality. There must be every kind of rank. There must be every kind of position in the, in the world found in the kingdom of heaven. There will not be one thing missing. There will be one element missing. For instance, we know that God, Lord Jesus Christ said, I have not come to save the just, but sinners. So how many types of sinners will be in heaven? Every type of sinner, the most wicked type of sinner, the traitor like Judas, those that despaired, like Judas himself also despaired, every type of sinner, there is going to be a conversion of each type. Every type of sinner, the incredibly proud, like St. Augustine, before he converted, he was filled with the most wicked pride. The impure, like St. Mary Magdalene. The worldly, like St. Francis Xavier. <clears throat> Every type of soul that has been a sinner that's walked away from God, every single one, there will be a conversion of two by two. A perfect number of each type shall be converted. They shall all be brought to the kingdom of God <clears throat> until the ark of the church triumphant is filled. Every single part of it is filled as God wishes to be filled. And then it's time for the world to come to an end. 
God is our loving Father. He looks down upon the earth. And what does he look upon? The just. What does it say about the coming chastisement? The Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24. You will hear about wars and rumors of wars and terrible persecution. And pray that your flight be not in winter because it will, or on the Sabbath. Because then there will be tribulation like there has never been since the, end of the, since the beginning of the world. There shall be great sorrows. There shall be difficulties. But the days shall be shortened. The days shall be shortened for the sake of the elect. Who does not? God always has his eyes. Dismas was a terrible thief. And Dismas was a wicked man. But Dismas was going to respond to the grace of God. He died at 3 p.m., but he made sure that before he died, Dismas received the grace of conversion, and Dismas went from Dismas the wicked to Saint Dismas, and he became the good thief that went into the kingdom of heaven. And so there are going to be saints in every age, in every situation in life, those that have, been, have, 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 have tried to commit suicide, and yet some of them will repent before they finish their suicide. Like the man who was, uh, whose, whose wife prayed for him for 40 years in the life of St. John Vianney. And she, he was a drunk, and he was living a wicked life, and he was beating her and bleeding most wickedly. But <coughs> she gladly took all the sufferings from that wicked husband on the condition that he would save his soul. And at the end of the 40 years, he jumped off a bridge and committed suicide. She went to St. John Vianney and said, What has happened? I prayed that he be saved. And he said, Don't worry. Your prayer was heard. Between the bridge and the water, as he jumped, he received the grace of perfect repentance. He repented of his sins, and he has saved his soul. The unrepentant sinner that was going to be executed for his crimes, and St. Teresa of the child Jesus prayed, and he was converted. God looks into the very extremities of all the souls. There shall be Satanists that repent. There shall be all kind of killers and wicked souls that repent. All kinds of impure that shall repent. Every kind of sinner. There is no type of sinner that cannot repent and become a saint. And God can draw saints from the farthest extremities of the universe. And the farthest extremity is the one that's farthest away from him. That's the farthest extremity of the universe. And God can make a saint out of each one. I have not come to save the just. He descended from heaven down to earth to go out and turn sinners into saints. To turn those that love him not into those that love him. Those that know him not into those that know him. Those that serve him not into those that serve him. And he is going to turn our most wicked hearts. He's here to make saints. And he knows who shall respond to his grace. And he's patient and patient and patient. But there will come a time when he says, All right, the number of saints is full. The number of the church militant is complete. And now ye angels go out and hurt the earth and hurt the sea. And blow the trumpet. And let the final judgment come upon the earth. And even that judgment is going to be a judgment of purification. What's going to happen on the day of the final judgment? On the day of the final judgment, fire is going to come from heaven. And it's going to eradicate all sin. Eradicate all sinners. And eradicate all stain of sin. And when the fire is complete... When we normally see a fire, it's quite an ugly sight than when it is finished. But when this fire is completed, we will see the world in which we are living right now infinitely more beautiful than it is right now. In this world that God created, it's very beautiful. It's exceedingly beautiful. But when the fire comes and wipes away the stain of the sin and all of the effects of sin in the grass and all the effects of sin in the stars and all the effects of sin in the, in the air and in the clouds and in all things... It's going to wipe it away completely. And the effects of the sinner will be so wiped away that there will be no memory of them. And the sinner shall be in the center of the earth in a place that is real and physical, 4,000 miles beneath my feet right now, which is hell. And they shall burn in that place forever, crushed for all eternity. In a very small place. But the earth and the universe shall be filled with light and filled with magnificence and filled with beauty. And we shall walk this same earth that we are on right now, and it shall become the new heaven and the new earth. It is the place of the saints. The history of the world is not the history of sinners who shall be forgotten. It is not the history of wickedness that shall be completely eradicated. It is the history of saints. We must play our part in the role of history. Mary Magdalene was useless. Mary Magdalene was worthless. Mary Magdalene was empty. She was of no value. Until one day she came with tears to the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And our Lord said to her, She has been forgiven because she has loved much. And from that love, she was able to, every day, from when our Lord Jesus Christ touched her on the forehead after the resurrection, every single day she levitated in the sky. And she saw God, and she communed with God, and she experienced the most magnificent visions and the most wonderful visions of any mystic of all time. And she did her life doing some good penance, and she died in southern France. And every day of her life was a life communing with God until she was able to pass to be with him because she loved much. And on the day of her judgment, the devil tried to come forward and say she was a prostitute and she was proud and she was wicked in every manner and she was vain and she had all manner of sin. And it is completely gone and forgotten like all the souls in hell. And all that is known is that she has loved much. And Dismas' devil came and spoke and said, This man was a thief all his life. He cursed God on the very day of the crucifixion. When he was hanging on the cross, he cursed him at 12 o'clock. But he saw a woman standing at the foot of the cross. And he saw that she was a queen. And he saw her, and his heart was transformed only for a few hours. How many moments did Dismas live a good life? Approximately two hours. Maybe three at the most. That's how much of his life was good. But that hour was spent suffering on a cross because he deserved to suffer on the cross because he was a most wicked man. But he looked down and saw the glory of Mary. He saw the beauty of Mary. He saw that she was a queen. And therefore he must be a king. And all he said to become a saint was, Remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. It's not that hard to be a saint. It is said of the damned that the greatest tragedy of the damned is that it'll recognize how easy it was to know, love, and serve God in this life. And how easy it was to turn back away from wickedness and go to the knowledge and love of God. But they did not. Hell would not be such a bad place if it was so hard to get to heaven. But it's easy to get to heaven. All we have to do is wash ourselves in the blood of the Lamb. All we have to do is cover our wicked sins with love, like the St. Mary Magdalene did. And we have followed the example of a great saint who is an example of all saints, and that is St. Augustine. Augustine is the greatest of all the fathers of the church. But he lived a wicked life, and he was so hard to repent because of his great pride. He was impure, but many men have been pure. And he had a wife, he had a girl he lived with him that was not married. He had a child out of wedlock, lived 13 years as a woman. And he was filled with all manner of wickedness, especially the great sin of pride. And his mother had to pray and weep many years for him to convert. And Ambrose, the great saint, finally, finally converted him. But what did Augustine do? Augustine said a famous prayer that most of us say, he finally accepted, Ambrose, St. Ambrose, you are right. My mother, you are right. I abandon all heresies. I abandon all wickedness. And I want to be a good Catholic. And I don't want to believe heresy anymore. So make me a saint. Make me a saint. But not yet. The famous prayer of Augustine. Make me a saint. Make me a saint, but not yet. Because he was still attached to his woman. He was still attached to impurity. He was still attached to this world. But he wanted to be a saint, but tomorrow. He wanted to be a saint, but at some other time. What made Augustine become a saint? Ambrose was not yet dead and a saint. Monica was not yet dead and a saint. It wasn't enough to put Augustine over the edge. So what did he do? One day he was walking down the street. He was not even saying any prayers. And he said to himself, Utsik, Utsik, Kur non ego. He was walking by himself one day and he said, As such and as such did, why not I? Mary Magdalene, she was impure. Mary Magdalene was filled with impurity. And one day she went to the feet of our Lord and she wept. And impurity was gone from her forever. So gone that you cannot find a trace of anything that is not perfect inside of her. And Mary of Egypt, she was also a prostitute several hundred years later. And she was filled with great wickedness. 
And she just went to the monk and went to confession and she wept and her sins were gone and she became a hermitess and died in the most wonderful glory and great happiness. What put Augustine over the edge? The learning and the contemplation of the lives of the saints. Saints cannot become saints without saints. They cannot. There was one saint in the Middle Ages in the 1200s, and he was performing miracles every day. I forget the name of the saint. can't remember. And they were walking by, and they said, Can you cure? My, my, my mother is dying. Can you cure her? And he said, Why are you asking me? Anthony is there. <laughs> Anthony is greater than I. Anthony is the real saint. Don't ask me. Go ask him. And so he did, and Anthony cured the one. There are saints, and saints cannot be saints without saints. The consideration of saints is so essential for us. Augustine wanted to be good. And his saint, living saint Monica prayed for him, but he was not yet ready to be good. And the living saint Ambrose prayed for him, but he was not yet able to be good. They were not yet in the fullness of their power because they weren't yet seeing God face to face. But Mary Magdalene, she was in the fullness of her power. Mary of Egypt, she was in the fullness of her power. And the other saints he considered, they were in the fullness of their power. And he remembered the saints. And then Augustine said, Cur non ego, ut seek, ut seek, as such and such. Why not I? And he left his impurity, and he went and was baptized, and he received the faith in the fullness of his heart. His son, who was eight years old, was baptized with him. And then he became a bishop of the church. And he became the greatest of all the bishops of the fathers of the church. John Chrysostom who was never impure. John Chrysostom who was never proud. St. John Chrysostom kneels before Augustine in heaven. And he says, Augustine is greater than I. Because Augustine finished his canonization. He became a saint because he learned of the saints. And the greatest of the missionaries was not Francis Xavier, but Ignatius, who created Francis Xavier. Ignatius, who created all the Jesuit missionaries that did more missionary work than all others in the whole history of the world. Where does it come from? It comes from the day when Ignatius got hit by a cannonball in his leg. And he was wounded at Pamplona, and he was laid up for one year. For one year, he couldn't do anything. He was bored out of his mind. And what did he have to do? Out of sheer boredom, he picked up a book called The Golden Legend. Only out of boredom. And he read the lives of the saints. And he read about the apostles, and he read about the great martyrs, and especially those girls, Emerenciana, and Lucy, and Agnes, and Cecilia. These ones were little girls, 13 years old, and they wiped out the emperor of Rome. They stood up against the greatest empire that ever was. They maintained their virtue. They maintained their purity. They maintained their faith. And they conquered through martyrdom the city and the kingdom of Rome. These are soldiers. This girl is tougher than me. Ignatius wanted to be a great warrior. And he realized Lucy was greater, and Cecilia was greater, and they were so much better than him. And he wanted to be a great warrior. So what did he do when he finally got his leg healed? He became a true warrior. He became a saint. Ignatius, whom we call saint, and who is saint, he could never be saint had he not learned about the saints who were before him. Remember what St. Paul tells us. Tradidi quoted Achepi, I have handed down that which I have received. Do we only hand down dogmas? Do we only hand down rules and regulations? How do we know those dogmas? How do I know that it's really true? Who is my real mother? How do I know that? Because there was once a monk in the French Revolution, and he was about to be put to death, a Benedictine monk. And they said, will you be so cruel as to put me to death without saying a few words to my mother? She's very nearby. And they said, all right, you're going to speak to your mother. Where is she? 
And he turned to the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he sang, Solve Regina. As he did every night at Compa, as a monk, he sang, Solve Regina, Mater Misericordiae. And these were his last words. Because the soldier was filled with such anger that that was his mother. That his Blessed Virgin Mary was his true mother. And they made up a martyr then and there ahead of all the others. Saints do not become saints without saints. How do we hand down that Mary is our mother? How do I know that? Because my mother told me, my holy mother the church, and my own mother. I know it because it is handed down to me by those who live with God inside of themselves. Can there be saints without saints? It is the will of God that there never be saints without saints. St. Thomas tells us, that how do we spread the faith? He can put the faith immediately in every person on the world if he wants to. But what does he want? He wants living human beings. He wants us to carry him to souls, to carry him to the ends of the earth. There can be no saints without saints. Augustine is not a saint without saints. Anthony is not a saint without saints. And no saint is saint without saints. St. Paul was knocked off his horse. And what had made him the greatest of apostles? Stephen was martyred. And Stephen said, Let not this sin be laid up to their charge. Forgive them, O Lord. And because of the martyrdom of St. Stephen, the very first martyr, the blood flowed into Saul of Tarsus, and he became the greatest missionary of the church. And therefore, it is a great lesson that Satan learned, but he still doesn't know what to do about it. The blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. There must be saints. Saints make saints, and there must be saints in every age. Each one of us must become saints, because in the end we must decide, am I going to be going two by two, by Noah, or am I going to be outside the ark and forgotten? Let me go up that plank. Let me go in it. And who closed the door? God closed the door. The scripture tells us, Noah did such a good job constructing the ark, he just forgot about one detail. No plan to close the door. Now, if the water comes in, it doesn't help much. He didn't have a plan how to close that big door. He didn't have a hinge. He didn't have a plan. But what happened? God closed the door, and God sealed the door, and God is the one that closed the door of the church. He will close it. Do you think that one of those that loves him will be on the wrong side? There shall not be one that is sorry for their sins that will be on the wrong side. There shall be one that tries to love him and dies in that love that will be on the wrong side. All of them shall find their way on the right side. And he will seal that door shut of the church triumphant. And all those on the outside, they shall perish eternally. The history of our world is the history of saints. And who is not a saint who strives not for sanctity is not a valuable part of history. He's got nothing to do with history. He's just another empty and forgotten and cleaned out soul that shall be crushed with all the dam and the center of the earth. Let's be part of history. Let's be part of what makes our age worth talking about. And our age is worth talking about because there must be saints amongst us. There must be those of us that want to carry Jesus Christ to the next generation and to all those that love him not and all those that know him not and all those that serve him not and turn them to those that do know and do love and do serve him. And we will try to know and love and serve in our own heart. That's what must happen. The story of the world is the story of all saints. Nothing else is worth talking about. Let's be part of that holy story. And follow the example of the great Augustine and all the great saints that are now with God forever. Let us you all in the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Amen.